Welcome to Turn Extension, a supplemental podcast for the Advanced Maneuvers YouTube channel. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Turn Extension. This is Tony or Polar Bear Cub on the forums. Hey everybody, it's Kevin Dowdark on the forums. Cutthroat Cure, Devin Marr. So, and today we've got a great episode. Um, last week, or I guess the week before, we ended up playing a bunch of Q&As, uh, well, I guess questions instead of just Q&As. And uh, so, Devin, I'm going to hand it over to you. Let's get it started. So this is an episode I'm super, super excited for. Um, one of the things I enjoy the most about uh, Turn Extension is the fact that we get so many responses from um, the people who listen to us, and uh, we like to focus on making sure that when we do an episode that we answer some of the questions that are asked us. Well, to make sure that people know that they can do that, we wanted to do an episode that was just completely about nothing but the questions that they had for us, and the response pool was amazing. We got th at least three full pages on a Word document filled with questions, um, which is just fantastic. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to go through all the questions, and um, you know, I'll call them out, and then what we can do is uh, just answer them as we go. All right, so the first question that was from Mr. Man, uh, Malorian, he asks us, what is the most Buccaneers each of you is willing to run? So let's see how many how much how many buck how many points does a buccaneer cost? I'm not sure. My answer is going to be zero, and so finding out the point cost doesn't really go really high on my list. Buccaneer, buccaneer is only six points. That's not bad. It's yeah, a lot it's, of uh, it's a lot of knockdown. It's not bad. I mean, Malorian's a huge fan, a, a huge friend of the cast. Several of us have enjoyed uh, his company on on different projects. But I honestly think that we can go on record by saying I think he has a problem. I think he has a buccaneer problem, and he needs to see a doctor about it because the answer is none. All right, fine. I guess I agree. None. For maybe now. one. Maybe one with Rulik Morclaw, no. but uh, no. otherwise none. Don't, no, don't actually, the, the I will, I will let, argue. I think that is a great idea. One the, with more like RuPaul. The second you let one buccaneer in, they all move in. They're just like a like a swarm of cockroaches. Yeah, exactly. Nice. They're, they they are the cockroaches of War Machine. Don't open your hearts to buccaneers, people. They will tear your life apart. One day you'll wake up in cold sweats and look around and there's 10 Buccaneers around you and you're like, where did I go wrong with my life decisions? Cold sweats? It's going to be a heat sweat. With that much steam-powered energy around you and that many Buccaneers, you're just going to be sweating oh, to death. We got jokes here, folks. Jokes. Oh. <laughs> okay, so the second question we got was from Emily Lavender. And they asked, if you guys could choose one caster that is not in your armies currently to play solely for a tournament, which would that caster be? So to clarify the question, are you saying that we're playing our normal factions and we get to choose a caster from outside of our factions? I think so, yes. Or or, or do we want to do it as in our current armies that we play? Uh, we'll go with the, we'll choose out of faction. I, like I mean, I could read out it. Of faction. Out of faction is probably really good. So... Yeah, so for me, um, I would go with Butcher 3. Man, just everything about Butcher 3 is just amazing. Like, just having him running ahead of a bunch of bloodthirsty, crazy trolls just wanting to tear everything apart, I think that could be kind of fun. So basically Madrick 2? Exactly. But he, but not on the verge of a of an errata, because I never see anybody go, hey, let's errata <laughs> Butcher 3, it's always well, Madrak 2, Madrak 2. I, I, I probably can imagine a couple people who would, wouldn't mind an errata on Butcher 3. Um, for me, it's probably going to be a scenario of I want to drop down a list of uh, Berserkers and Juggernauts behind Father Lacan. Oh, that would be pretty cool. That would definitely be nice. I mean, I'd probably miss the, because he's only Matt 6, I think. He's a Matt, he's, 
Matt six, yeah. Matt well, actually, six. if it's in my faction, I don't have to worry about it because my jacks aren't aren't uh, COC jacks, so I keep my own mat and and whatnot. So yeah, I'm gonna just do a bunch of zerkers behind zerkers and uh, juggernauts behind uh, uh, Father Lacan to shove a run of a bunch of them forward feet and go. Okay, good luck. So mine would honestly be Borka Cake Slayer, not necessarily because of his rules. I mean, I think his rules are pretty good, but just because I am in love with Borka, and I feel like Borka leading a just a group of uh, Stormblades and Trenchers would just be the greatest thing ever. I feel like I would just theme them all out just to be a bunch of drunks that he just pulled together, and unfortunately, they can't hold their liquor nearly as well as Borka can. So you're attracted to it because it's a kindred spirit? Yes, that's truly what it is. <laughs> he he. Every time I look at Borka, I always want to play trolls. Every single time, because I just love his fluff. Funny thing is, the same thing goes for Devin. <laughs> I love Borka. Everything about Borka. Honestly, if I had to pick an infection caster, that's my favorite. It is Borka one. So I'm excited. All right. So the next question is, this one is for um, one of us specifically. This one goes out to you, Kevin. Um, Miko, I'm not even going to try and pronounce his last name. Why do some in your group say minions are not a real faction and neither are retribution? Now as Mark III, both are truly playable. Um, and so he just wants to know your thoughts on that. Why I have the hater aid for minions, uh, Nico. Honestly, it's a carryover from Mark II, um, and it, you know it was it's one of the scenarios where it was you know the running joke of minions isn't a real faction. Um, there's probably a bit of of uh, tortured bias to it because Gaston has repeatedly beaten the snot out of me with his pigs. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't have the best of luck against, uh, Iron Ledge W's gators either. So, yeah, they're just not a real faction. Just listen to what I'm saying and accept it as true. You know, be like my kids. Do what you're told, not what, what you, what you want. <laughs> as for Rhett, they're fucking dirty point ears. Like, that's not even, that should never be a real faction. Um, he also says that he would love to see a game where Menoth goes against Retribution. So we definitely have a viewer request on uh, our next battle report. So we put Gaston playing Gaston? Basically. Maybe we can get Donnie to play Gaston, or War Machine to play Gaston. I think he might have actually gotten rid of his Menoth. Oh, man. Yeah, I think he, he went whole hog into to trolls, and I think his Menoth might have gone to the wayside. That's upsetting. I know he snagged Cricks, so... So, the next question is um, from Gavriel01. I always wondered, are there even stronger players at your local game store who aren't featured on the battle reports because they don't paint their minis? So, I feel like our local gaming area on meta is pretty big. So we live in the greater DC area. Um, most of the cast is from North Virginia. So that covers pretty much south of DC, almost everything, a little bit north. Um, Devin, you're from the West Virginia area. Yeah, my meta covers Pennsylvania, uh, northern, I think it's northern Maryland. So it covers northern Virginia, West Virginia, and the in the Panhandle, Pennsylvania, and um, a little bit of Maryland. So yeah. yeah, I've got four states right around me. And then with mine, it's pretty much the the, the Baltimore uh, down to Southern Maryland area. So w our meta is huge because everything's realistically an hour to an hour and a half away from two major cities. Even with uh, actually three major cities, so Baltimore is an, about two hours away from Philly, and we have a lot of great players up there. And then. Uh, just south of Baltimore is, is D.C. And then even south of D.C. is Richmond. So we pull from a lot of areas. Unfortunately, we just don't have the cameras to get all those people on. Now, some of the people aren't fully painted, but I know um, Devin's there's starting to record. Yeah, so there's actually a lot of people that aren't fully painted. Um, so I know Devin is starting to get more people on camera up in his area, and as soon as I am not as terrible as a person, 
there's a lot of really strong people in our area. I mean, we have um, one of the judges, Jonathan LeClaire, is, is an amazing player. And then we have a couple other ones. Uh, Anthony uh, Gibbs just ended up getting back into the uh, game. Great player. Cannot wait to try to get him on uh, the channel. Uh, but we just haven't had the ability to because a lot of them either they're not painted or they're just not kind of a, available whenever we are recording. So we're trying to kind of expand our recording capabilities to capture more people so you get more of a variety for our guests. Have we gotten a game where LeClaire is actually... He, he's been no. on a tournament report, but not a battle report. Yeah, he's been on That's tournament. something we... I, I, um, I know. It's, it's my fault. It's honestly the, the the gist of it is there are a lot of really really good players in the in the three to four states that we can potentially record from, but a good majority of them either have conflicting schedules to get a recording in or don't have fully painted armies. And that was at, at the inception of advanced maneuvers. That was one of the rules where, that that for better lack of terms, I laid down, because everybody always complains that I forced them to paint their models, um, was battle reports of silver models is extremely boring as hell to watch. Like, it is, can be confusing in a lot of cases. So it's always been a situation of we've loved to have people on. We've had guests. A, a prime example is, is uh, you know, we have a, a, a couple videos that we've recorded at conventions with fans of the show. Like, fans came up and were like, I love your battle reports. And we've been like, cool, you want to be on one? And, you know, it's just a, an opportunity. But it's a situation of, I mean, as much as we'd love to get people on, if they're not fully painted, that's like, that's the threshold to get into advancement. You have to be fully painted. Skill? Skill is not an issue. You could be the worst player in the world if you're fully painted. We'll throw you on a battle report, but it's the it's the painting requirement that holds a lot of people from actually getting on. So a shameless plug: um, if you are interested in getting um, a game in with one of the advanced maneuvers or being on an advanced maneuvers battle report, you know, send us a Facebook message, um, and we'll try and get in touch with you, set something up. And do we have an email, Kevin? I believe there is actually an email called advanced.maneuvers at gmail.com that Iron Lich W monitors, but I don't think we've ever actually used it for anything. Yeah. So, so the Facebook would probably be the best bet. So if you if you get into this area around Baltimore, D.C. area, or the Northern Virginia, just let us know through Facebook, and we'll try and set you up and maybe get you onto a battle report as long as you're fully painted. And even if you don't want to be on a battle report and you're going to be in the area, if it's like a Wednesday or Tuesday, reach out to us because just it'd be great to play. All right. So the next question is, um, this one is a little bit longer, um, but this I think this is a good one. Um, it's from Jockberg. He, he tells us that he really enjoys our content and that he just got into Kador. He's, um, and he has a few questions for us, mainly about the Advanced Maneuvers group. He says, he asks if we're primarily a YouTube channel, or do we post on a forum or have a premium site to see all of our content? That's the first part of the question. So, whenever we first started Advanced Maneuvers, we wanted to make, uh, one of the big things that we pushed for was we wanted to not make money out of it, because, uh, you know, Kevin has said this multiple times, that as soon as we pull a dollar from the fans, all of a sudden there's an obligation. It doesn't, it no longer becomes fun, it becomes work. So kind of one of the things we've always done is we, we have never, we are, our goal is to never charge anybody for any of the content we put out because it's something we do for fun. We just want to, want to do it. We've, at this point, we have no intention of setting up a Patreon. We have no ex attention, intentions of doing a premium podcast, something like that. Because this is just, it's, we're just a bunch of nerds that like to do this. So for us, we don't have one. Um, for a site or a forum, we've talked about it in the past. But I don't know if we're at a point now where, I don't know. I, we might be at a point where we could do a web, uh, do have a website and put up uh, some stuff every week. But I'm just, I'm, I don't know. Kevin, you want to take that over? 
the, the biggest thing about a website and, and one of the things that's always kind of because I mean it's I mean with the with the ability of standing up you know simple customization websites now on the internet it's not hard to to, to you know it's not very costly and it's not hard to set up a site that we could produce the problem is is the content flow um, it we you know it, it takes it, it may not seem like it but it actually takes a lot of effort to get a video out every week um, and then between that and the podcasts and the hobby contents it's a bandwidth issue for a lot of us like it just we don't necessarily have this because we still have full-time jobs we have families we have kids uh, that we need to manage and I don't know if anybody really has the bandwidth to manage a website and produce enough content to make the website you know worthwhile um, one of the one of the two jobs that I do is I do web development and one of the standard rules of web development is um, you need to be turning around relevant content every 24 hours or your site will become OBE in a short period of time because people won't have the drive to come to it we don't have content we don't have 24 hours worth of content we have Fridays you know, Monday, Monday every once in a while for hobby content, and then these Tuesday podcasts. And that's it. We don't have people writing articles. We don't have people doing stuff. I just don't. We never really felt like we have enough content to be worthwhile to represent an accurate site. And honestly, even with uh, even with the the turning center, I mean, this is finally the first time. This is our third try, and it's finally getting off the ground. You know, something more that we can do because something we can produce better. Definitely, we <laughs> third time's a charm crossing fingers yeah hopefully not to mention I mean between the eight of us or nine of us between the nine of us we're so interconnected to so many other different websites or forums uh, and Facebook that we kind of you know we do kind of put a lot of stuff out there I mean I mean we have the War Machine Hordes painting group we have the advanced maneuvers Facebook page I mean we we do a lot of conversations on the actual forums but mostly as individuals so advanced maneuvers as itself um, you know most of the content that as we're trying to build up you know a website's not really going to benefit it as much um, and keep you know the ability for us to produce you know fast and you know efficient content for you guys on a budget since you know we don't make a single cent from any of this by our choice like I mean I know that there are some groups out there who have patreons and have abilities to to make money it's it's not a matter of we don't make a single cent. Whoa, ho, feel bad for us. It's actually our choice. We've actually had fans contact us privately and be like, where can I, do you have a tip jar or anything that we can send money to you? And we always turn them away because this is for fun. This is free. This is, you know, thank you for, for thinking about us and all that, but we have no desires to make money off of this. This is almost like PGing without PGing. Like we're just doing it for the community, for the fun of it. And, you know, we don't necessarily want to be feel that we're beholden to providing something because we're getting a paycheck. And I mean, just just a simple fact of you guys sharing our content or commenting on it or, you know, just like today, asking us questions like that's really what brings a lot of excitement to us. And that is the real, re you know, reward we receive. So the second part of his question is um any of us are running this channel um the answer to that is nine and um i think we answered all of his question he just wants us to tell us about the channel so um any other information you two can think of about the channel to uh might be uh you know be good to know um i mean i think kevin's a lot of it yeah it's uh, so we do the we do the weekly battle reports you know, we're trying to stay as consistent as possible with that. Um, obviously, it has to be fully painted. And the only other two things really putting out right now is the uh, the the Monday videos that that you're doing the cutthroat corner, and then uh, the turn extension. I mean, other than that, it's just I don't know. We all came together just because of uh, through War Machine, pretty much. That's how actually I've met all of you guys. I know Kevin. I know you knew some of the other group before that. Yeah, but. it's 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 all Gaston's fault. I mean, really, when you boil down to it, it's all Gaston's fault. I agree. So another question that we got was from Johnny Lone Wolf Goldmane. 
And um, one of the things about this is that it's a question that we found so interesting that we're actually going to do a full episode. It's probably not going to be our next episode, but um, I definitely think that people should know what the question is and know that we will be answering this later. It's, the question is, as a new player, what tips and tricks about the game do we recommend or should people know? So uh, we're going to do a full episode about that one just because uh, there's a lot of tips and tricks and, you know, since we have a lot of questions to get through, uh, we just wanted to let you know that we are going to answer that later. I also want to go on record by saying, dude, that's an amazing screen name. That is, is pretty screen. good. All right, so our next question is Aaron Englands. They ask, are you happy with the way the current meta is shaping up versus where we were at the end of MK2? Who do you see as your top five casters right now? Tony, we'll start with you. All right, so current meta in the Mark 2, who do you see as top five? Your top five casters? Um... So I haven't played a whole lot of games, but I'm guessing it's just the overall meta who we see as, as the strongest or within our faction. Well, I think they want to know, like, how do you feel about the meta as a whole? Is it is it good, bad, ugly? Is it falling apart, whatnot? And then just, like, who is the... It's The second question is, you know, who's your favorite top... Two, who's your top two casters? Let's top do five. it top... Let's do top five in faction. Okay. Let's switch it up a little bit. Just, that may not be what they're asking exactly, but it is kind of open-ended, so let's have a little fun with it, and let's do uh, who is the top five casters in our faction. So I think overall the meta, I'm pretty happy with it at this point. I mean, it's still so new, it's exciting. This is very much so how it was whenever we transitioned from Mark 1 to Mark 2. Um, I think the uniqueness of lists are really exciting. Um, on the other hand, so I, I've, I recently become a mod on the forums, uh, which is exciting because you kind of get to see I, I'm paying more attention to what people are saying on the forums, and th there is some negative things. It, it sucks because you do hear about some people's metas falling apart because of Mark III, but on the other end, you're hearing about a lot of metas that are re-energized because of it. My old meta uh, down in Fredericksburg, uh, probably the last year, year and a half maybe of Mark II, it just um, it completely died out. You know, it was just it, it became. They, they didn't like how the game was going. Um, and it was just a, a lot of rules interactions. It felt like all the time there was just a lot of miscommunication. And, and there's still a lot of that right now in the beginning of Mark Three, But just the, some of the changes that they made are just, I am so excited about I could not have been more excited when I found out about Power Up. If nothing else at all had changed in the meta, everything stayed the exact same with War Machine, but just adding Power Up made me so happy because it, I love Jax. I love Warjax. That was the sole reason why I got into the game. Um, but they were never viable to play. And now, just because of Power Up, they become extremely viable to play in, in this game. So, overall, I'm pretty excited about where the current meta is kind of at and what we're doing because it's just so, like, brand new. Um, and for the top five casters, I love Maddox. I think Maddox is absolutely awesome. Um, I like Haley too. Love Kane too. Siege, Siege is always gonna be my boy. Always my boy. He is great. And uh, though she just came out yesterday, we saw the rules. I'm kind of really excited about Allison Jakes. I'm excited about her because I think she's going to do different things. Like she's she's gonna be just fun to play, and I'm excited. Don't get me wrong, I, I pretty much love almost all of our other casters. The only one I'm really bummed about is is kind of Darius. And I'm bummed about Darius because of uh, Grievous Wounds is so so much out there right now that it it, may, it makes him less powerful. So that's where I'm at. So I, I'm frustrated with the meta right now. And I can't tell if it's the rules or if it's the players. But I'm frustrated by the fact that in my specific in, in the in the Fairfax meta that I play with, there's still several hordes players, but the hordes participation has just tanked off the charts. And I don't know if that is a combination of 
everybody wants to play with the war machines because it's you know it's it's all new shiny and yada 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 and maybe after a year it plays out but i'm frustrated that there are so many people and it doesn't seem to be just my store it seems to be carte blanche across the board is that everybody is basically like horde sucks horde shit you know it's it's only the true diehards who are trying to find a way to make it optimal or make it work um and again i don't know if that's just the player or if that's indicative of the rules I have to give it time but so that's so why I'm not saying I'm I don't hate the meta I don't love the meta I'm just frustrated with the meta in a lot of the people and how they're reacting to it um faction wise I'm still really really fucking new to to uh, to Kador so my current pairings right now is um I have a couple lists that I'm tossing around because I'm still trying to resolve uh uh, Kozlov, uh, trying to figure out where his his perfect niche is. I, I'm still a huge fan of my Butcher Three Butcher Bots list, and P Sorsha, um, uh, and to to round out the last two, um, I I want to play Harkovich. Like the fact that we have more Jack functionality, I want to give Harkovich a go, and I want to give. Karchev ago, like I think Karchev is amazing in the new system with power up and all that, and I, I want to see how he plays out. Um, and nowhere, anywhere, shall there be any sort of play of Malakov except in his junior form, because I hate that model. I don't hate the model. I'm disappointed in that model. Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> um. For me, I'm super happy with how the uh, the overall standing with the, the greater meta is. I like Mark III a lot. I feel like War Machine got a little bit stronger, but um, there's definitely a lot less complaining when I play people about ho how overpowered Hordes is. So that alone made me very happy because it feels like, you know, I can play a, a cleaner game and still, you know, feel like I didn't, like cheat someone out of it or be made to feel like I cheated someone out of it. Uh, as for casters in my faction, I would definitely have to say my top five are currently Madrak 2, Ragnar, um, Borka 1, Borka 2, and I'm excited for Calandra. I haven't, I played her a little bit in Mark 2, but I'm really super excited to play her in Mark 3 um, when she's out of uh, her old tier. So that's a good, that's a good place for me to be. All right. So next one is from Mr. Godzilla Fan 801. He says, what are some techniques you guys use to improve your play? I'm not talking about best faction or net decking, but genuine techniques are things to improve as a player overall. I'll start with this one. I have to say that if there was one thing that I would say that is a technique or a thing that will improve you as a player in general, it's going to be listen to other people um, when they try to maybe give you some advice. Like take constructive criticism. Um, not from everybody, and I, I, that doesn't mean change your list to meet what everybody says. I mean when you play a game and somebody tries to give you a point or point something out to you, actually listen to them and you know absorb what they're saying because that is going to make you a better player overall so I, I, oh sorry Kevin you can go uh, I couldn't agree more I think you know getting getting the opinions of the people that you play is probably going to serve you well just by the mere fact of they get to see it's not it's no longer about the list it's about how you played the list and the, the tips that they might that they might have picked up that they might have seen um, they I, there's gonna be two that I'm about to say and honestly they are well knowns but they were they're still true they're still staples of improving your gameplay and that is one get out there and play games. No amount of toilet, toilet bowl sitting list creation is going to make you a better player. No amount of net decking or anything like that is going to make you a better player. If you are not out there on the table playing the game, you will not improve. It is impossible to improve your gameplay by merely reading a book or looking at your phone. Um, and then the second one is if you have the ability to record your games so that you can review them later, 
that will improve. Like us being on this channel, all of us have improved merely by the fact that we record our games and we can go back and we have to watch them again to do our voiceovers. And we'll have situations where we're watching our videos, doing our voiceovers, and we're like, why in the hell did I do that? That is improvement. Um, it's, it's, and if you don't, it, obviously not everybody's got a video camera to record their game. So maybe it's a scenario of you just take, uh, Gaston does this all the time. He takes snapshots of the table after every turn so that he can go back. Sometimes he writes battle reports on that. Other times he's just going back and looking at the, looking at the positionings going, I know how this game played out. Was there something in my positioning that caused me to end up poorly and you can go back and look at those positionings and not have to rely on your memory to 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 figure that out yeah so i think everything else was pretty good the the only other thing i would say is uh you know besides just playing as many games as possible is um whenever you're playing against opponents ask tell them what your list is and ask them hey what like I, i'd like to play against com like powerful casters or ask them hey this is this is the caster i want to play against uh so seeing what possible things could pull apart your army um it's it's painful because in a way if you tell them what your army is going to be they can build a list completely around just destroying your army or something you can't do and the reality is that probably won't happen too often at tournaments but there's a chance that could come up so if you are playing against an opponent that that wants to help you push your game to a next level and you say hey this is the list i'm playing can you put something together that we might see in a tournament they will they will do their best to not net deck against you but build a strong enough list that you will that you will realistically see so you have to play against that um and that just i feel like that hones you as a player to make sure that you know all right you've played against that you've seen what your list can do and instead of completely changing the entire list only change one or two things Play with it for a week and see if you need to tweak it again. That actually reminds me of something else that that I, I do all the time in my when I'm playing. Um, when you're playing somebody and that something comes up and they're like, "Oh, I didn't do this," or "I forgot to do this," or something like that. If the game state hasn't been changed, let them do it. You will become a better opponent for playing somebody at their best than you will for playing somebody who forgot to do something. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with that. A last little thing I would say, and definitely I am guilty with it when I played both of you guys, and it's one of the it's one of the techniques that I have learned that I feel has really made me a better player, is that after any game you play, win or loss, ask your opponent what they feel you could have done better or, you know, things that they were really surprised about. Now, this is not always going to turn out well. You're going to have, especially if you won, you might have people who and are very grumpy and walk away. But 90% of the time, the feedback that you get on your gameplay, you know, is usually very beneficial. I know I've done it with both um, Tony and Kevin when we've played games, and it's definitely things that I've learned a lot from. So Cat Daniels says, during MK2, I noticed there was a seeming lack of battle reports focused on convergence and retribution. I just have two questions concerning them. Why haven't we seen these factions as much as the others? question is, will we be seeing more of these factions as time passes for MK3? So, yes, you will. The reason why, one of the reasons you didn't see very much Convergence is in our group, I'm the only one that plays Convergence that enjoys it. Um, that's almost I, that's almost a meta statement, not just our group. Yeah, there that's are pretty very, much a, very few Convergence players in this meta. I think our, in our entire meta of, I guess, the 10 or 15 stars, I mean, Devin, you could probably speak this better than anybody else in Star Wars. How many, how many people are playing Convergence in Star Wars? One person. So we have one, one person, person who is out of eight teams. Out of eight teams of five people each, just looking at that um, information, we have one person who's actually playing convergence. So, and that's where it is. It's, it's really hard to find other convergence players. Um, and honestly, for me, I, I've I've only been able to record two games since Mark Three started, and both of them been Signar. Um, I'm really excited about Signar right now, but I have been putting my Convergence on the table because uh, 
Gary is going to do a lot of good things to, to, to play Signar better. Um, I love Signar. I am not as good as, at Signar as I am at Convergence. I'm not sure why, because I, I don't know. But I feel when I play Convergence, I have a better game. So that's why for the Convergence. When it comes to Retribution, we have some great Retribution players, but none of them had their armies painted. Um, the first one I could think of is uh, Chris Tanzos. He 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 just he's a he's an amazing painter, but he just doesn't he didn't have the armies that we wanted that he wanted to put on the table painted. Now Gaston has picked up convert uh, has picked up um, retribution, so you will be seeing more retribution on the table. Also, currently in my meta, we have a a player who is who his main army is Convergence, and he's currently just trying to get it all painted up so he can get it on the table. So that comes again into an earlier statement of it's just a fact of people not having their material painted so that we can offer you guys, like, better, um, you know, better, better content. <laughs> all right, so the next one is from WM Dragon. He's asking us a question about the Iron Fangs and Winter Guard Rifle Corps with Kozlov. I'm going to table that to say that, you know, um, Facebook message about that question, and um, you and Kevin, he can try and give you his thoughts on it. But I, so part of your question that I did want to answer on the podcast is that um, do we th- – uh, which style of Kador do we think we'll be seeing more of? Glass cannon infantry supported with warjacks or aggressive tanky infantry? I think you're going to see both. In all honesty, I think both um, have really viable play styles in this, this game. I, I think the, the majority is probably going to end up being a scenario where it's anywhere from two to three jacks and then high deep, high def infantry. The, the, shooting just... me, the shooting meta is too strong for for infantry that can't. Uh, not be hit because hitting is not an issue. They reduce Kador's infantry pretty heavily. Uh, it's more a matter of can you kill. So if you um, if you have high defense, it, it may be, it makes it a little. So maybe stuff like occultation, uh, you know, eliminators. Uh, maybe I'm I'm not a huge fan of Kayazi assassins right now, but I think it's going to be. I don't know if if Iron Fangs are necessarily going to like. I'm I'm actually enjoying regular Iron Fangs over Black Dragons, even though I used to enjoy Black Dragons for their armor, I think regular Iron Fangs are faster, and it's all about getting that engagement and shutting that shooting down right now. All right. So, thoughts in flight. He actually put two parts of his question, and I've had to piece them together because he was really tired when he originally posted the question. <laughs> but his his question is, at the beginning of a game, deciding to go second seems like an advent- advantage do we feel like this is going to be something that we see a lot more of, like people fighting to go second? I think that most people are still going to aim for first. Um, so going second allows you to set tempo. It's it's your ability to turn around and say, okay, I am now scoring. You have to respond. Like it's, it's more of a reactive positioning, sets the tempo of the game and all that going first allows you to alpha strike and if you can alpha strike your opponents the second you are up on points and can remain up on points your opponent's playing a downhill game and that's more control than than actual control points is control so i think people are still going to heavily push for going first and trying to trigger that alpha uh, and remove your models and then determine if they can set tempo after that tony your thoughts uh same thing man i agree i I think it's gonna I, I, I think there's advan- I still think there's advantages going uh, first and second. I, for me, it just depends on the list on what I want to do. It- I agree with that wholeheartedly. It, it, for me, I have a list that I prefer to go second, but I also have a list that, you know, if I can go first, I would like. Like when I play the Mountain King, I like to go second just because it gives me that extra three inches, and they're already moving closer, so maybe I get, um, you know a bottom of one uh, assault off on something and and start that that piecemeal you know start the point trading right off the bat so i definitely feel that it really depends on the list you're playing so the next question um is from the joe and i am 
neither of us are really sure what you're you're talking about with the Dester's attack flowchart. So if you could like link something to us, send us something, um, you know, maybe the conversation about that that's on the forums, we can uh, we can go into that a little bit more. All right, so the next question is no prey remains. He says, I'm wondering why people are saying you cannot charge knockdown models. Um, he's part of a small group of players who are very new to the game, and they can't work out why they were having that issue about n knockdown models. Now, Kevin, I know you had started to answer him on the forums, but um, if you want to address that. It, so the, the reason why it came up is because prior to the errata that just dropped, uh, what, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, something like that, um, there was a, a rule stating where you could not use abilities like flank or... Um, uh, oh, man, why my brain shut down? Um, flanker gang. Dang, flanker gang, thank you. Um, if you were not engaged with a model, and a model who is knocked down or who is stationary cannot be engaged. So it was a confliction of, of word usage in the rules. Um, that was since clarified and is no longer an issue. So it's just a scenario of it used to be an issue because of wording and is no longer an issue. So you don't have to worry about it anymore. So all fixed. Thank you, Privateer Press. All right, so David Canty has had a few questions for us that he's actually asked um, on multiple of our episodes. And so um, I We're split him up him. a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but no, his first question for us is, has the new open contract status really improved mercs and minions? Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I think it really has. It's There's so much more you can do, especially with, I'm seeing minions a lot, you know, we're seeing minions more, and I, I think it's just opened up a lot. Yeah, it's it's the, the, the diversity that it provides can can do nothing but improve mercs. Like, at one point in time, they had models that they couldn't use, now they can. By that very statement, they are better for it. Yeah. The only thing I'm bummed about is I wish it would have allowed more Cephalex to be used. That's the only thing that sucks, but I understand, like, some things you just can't do, so... I wish that they would have, with all of the things that have been going on, I still wish they would have put Cephalix into Crix. Yeah. With, with all the issues of, well, you need less infantry and you need to use more jacks, quote-unquote. Crix might not necessarily be in a bad spot if they had a bunch of cheap wreckers at their disposal. It's a good point. It gives them a little bit of a diversity on what um, they can apply. I, uh... For me, I some would call them actually a, a real faction now due to that. So, uh, so I, I definitely know I can say with the information that came from Store Wars, um, we allowed all of the players the ability to you know switch one of their previous selected factions um, for another one with Mark III and um, the most changed faction too. Um, most people changed a, a core faction and actually changed two mercs. And I know that happened at least like six or seven times. So, I mean, it, it, that alone shows to me that uh, it really improved them. So, we're going to go to Stephen Smith. He says, what do you think the new theme lists will do? Will they give discounts or do you think they are coming up with something more interesting? Uh, he honestly didn't like the discount discounts before because it seemed like it forced you to play one of those lists over the ones without discounts. Your thoughts? We'll start with you, Tony. So I, I think we're still going to be seeing discounts, but if you look at how Kingmaker's army came out, um, I think they did it in a really, really good way. Um, they provided discounts where you get a free solo, but they limited it so much where it's, I, I think, a total of six or seven solos. So it's you're getting free stuff. It's not necessarily better playing outside of it but it does add some interesting flavor it encourages you to play it but doesn't necessarily say hey this is a better uh, group to play so I think we will see discounts I think we'll also see some more interesting stuff after listening to matter of pact um, the most recent episode they uh, they had will Hungerford on and he was talking about how you know they there's a we're gonna be seeing a lot of I think units that are going to change whenever you take them in theme. So it sounds like the trencher one, there might be different trencher groups that you can use that you can only use within that theme. It's kind of like what we saw uh, towards the end of Mark II 
for the uh, the the arcanic uh, the, the the mechanic that they had the solo for retribution. If you took him in the steam force, he was a different model, and I I think we'll see that more as well. The arcanist. I'm, the arcanist. Yeah, I'm I'm worried about them doing point reduction models. Like I think I'm I think I'm in the same boat as as David that it becomes a situation where if I can play against my opponent and I can be 10 points up over them, why wouldn't I? So, I'm hoping that the 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 kingmaker and the cephalix aren't examples that everybody's going to get points, but uh in in PP we trust, I hope, I guess. We we hope we can trust that they they'll do it right. I think it's going to be interesting. I like the flavor they're going for, and I like how one of my favorite things used to be is in the no quarters, they would release the tier lists, and they would have, like, the storyline that goes with it, and you would read it, and then you could build your army kind of going with that. And we definitely saw it with King Kingmaker or Kingsmaker, whichever one it was called, um, you kind of got a little bit of that, and they they really focused on things. So I, I, I'm excited to see theme lists. And um, I never felt like I was forced to play one of those lists. Maybe I'm just like a, you know, a unique snowflake. I, I played Runes of War maybe in one tournament my entire time of playing. And I mean, I never played um, EE. So I mean, the, the, the net list that people really focused on, I never really went to. So maybe I'm a little bit different in that. But I think that's a good question, Steven. All right, so now we're going to go to another one of David's. Um, it says, he already asked us, He's asked us how we think battle engines are shaping up. And do we think that Colossal versus multiple jacks in terms of efficiency? So I will start this one. Um, I think battle engines are really shaping up. I know one of my favorite models was the War Wagon for Trollbloods. And he had sat on my shelf with a lot of planned... Um, planned things to happen, but it never happened because I just couldn't find a list to put him in. And currently, he is in one of my lists, and um, I am putting all of my converting um, ideas into place now because of the fact that battle engines are much better. Um, as for colossals or gargantuans for versus multiple jacks, I think it depends on which side of the game you're playing. I think that gargantuans are more efficient with warlocks than colossals for casters, but casters can um, run more jacks. So I think that if you're playing on War Machine side, you should be running a lot of jacks. And if you're playing on the Horde side, I think Gargantuans are more efficient. So what do you think? We'll start with Kevin. Uh, I'll agree with you on the on the the colossals and gargantuans. I actually haven't had a huge amount of play with them, but I can see where you're coming from on that. So I won't spend much time on that. I will say that battle engines are playable now, but I think that you're not going to see many of them, if at all, unless it is a battle engine that has the capacity of boosting through some sort of mechanic. That has always been and has always and always will be the limitation of battle engines is they're not a jack, they cannot be augmented by boosting or anything like that. And they're they're a decent point sink uh, for less hit points than a jack and you don't have the ability to manipulate your dice mechanics. So if the battle engine can't do any sort of boostings, I don't think it's gonna be seen that often. So I haven't looked at the Signar Battle Engine at all, so I'm not sure with him. But uh, the Converged one, he's freaking awesome. The TEP is just, he's great. The fact that he can focus fire, or he can shoot out multiple attacks, or he can boost his uh, his his range roll, it's, he's he's great. Uh, so for him, I'm, I'm excited. I've built multiple lists with the TEP in it. Um, when it comes to Colossals, I have not put, uh, I am still struggling to put a storm, uh, storm Wall in a lot of my lists. I think I've got one in Haley, and I still think Darius has some option, but I don't see myself putting as many Storm Walls in as I did before. You know, I have two Storm Walls, and I'm, I'm almost positive I will not be putting two Storm Walls on the list anytime soon. All right, so our 
All for our next question is going to be from Dennis Bronx. He says, "What is our overall opinion on Mark III so far? Faction balance, diversity, play style, or whatever. What springs to mind to MK2?" Now I know we kind of answered a question that was similar to this, but I think that one of the things that we should discuss is what about the faction balance, diversity, and play style. And we'll start with uh, Tony on this one. So I think right now it's still way too early to talk about faction ba balance, diversity, and play style just because we're only a few months into this. Um, there's only been, I think, one tournament that happened. I was listening to Chain Attack. I remember that. And I think at two out of the three top factions were actually hordes. Um, I think after we see stuff from Gen Con this past weekend, uh, so after this comes out, Gen Con will already be over. Um, I think we'll start seeing a little bit more about faction balance and diversity and kind of where factions shook out at. But I, I just, I don't know. I, I think it's too early to see really how everything's going because we just haven't had enough reps. I, I, I think we'll see it more six months into the game when we've had a, a multiple major tournaments. I think as a whole, the factions themselves are internally balanced in the sense of PP went out of their way to make sure that there wasn't a scenario where there were auto includes. Now, there's exceptions to the norm. Um, you know, there are some units, uh, I'll pick on Cato Rifle Corp, that seem to just consistently keep showing up in lists. But those are exceptions, they're not the norm. Most other lists have scenarios where it's like, I could take this one or I could take this one. It just depends on which unit's functionality I need. So I think from an internal standpoint, the, the inside the factions themselves, I think they're balanced. I think the factions as a whole across all of War Machine and Hordes are not balanced. I think there are uh, factions who have benefited from the Mark III changes or been hindered by the Mark III changes more than any of the other factions. A prime example of that being look at Crix and look at how they just dropped off the face of the earth. That's not just a case of Crix, you know, frustration salt tears of a new faction they've had time to adjust they've had time to think about it and people aren't coming back they're staying away from the faction so i think that there's going to and i don't know if it's a scenario of we're just waiting for a couple new mark three model releases to rebalance it out but i don't think all factions are created equal that's my opinion I think it really comes down to how people are playing it, too. I mean, I know that the Crix player in my meta, Nablus, he's still super strong, and he still dominates games a lot. I, but I also know that he was very open to change. So he changed a lot of his play style to meet how the new Crix plays. Um, and I think that's... I think one of the biggest things about Mark III is the fact that a lot of people are stuck in this old mindset of how their faction plays, and with if you're not staying open-minded, you don't get the you know the full effect of the changes, and therefore you might be playing behind. So that's how I feel with that um, diversity. I definitely feel like um, there's just as many Signar players as there were in the past, so it's pretty diverse that way. Um, <laughs> Uh, I do see that Kator is getting a good bit of love. And that I, I do believe that not everybody is created equal, but I definitely feel that if people change their styles, that we're going to see a lot more balance maybe with future releases. So, and I definitely would say that play styles have changed a lot. Um, there's a few factions that I know that do not play the same way that they played um, to go. What do you what do you, what about you guys? Yeah, but it's you know that that is a matter of play style and all that's a matter of ironing out the factions and I think as Tony said it's way too early for us to be like this is the play style of Cricks. People are still trying to unlock their factions. Um it's going to take time. We are we are on we are still in our infancy of this new edition and Unfortunately, you can't rush it. This stuff takes time. For things to get ironed out, it takes time. Okay, so here we go into our last question um, asked to us by David Canty. And his last question is, armor versus defense skews. Which way do you feel that Mark III is going? And we will start with Kevin. Mm, it's not. It's neither. 
Um, I think infantry is probably going more towards defense skew. Um, I think armor obviously is the the jack. So it's it's not necessarily a um, it's one or the other. I think it's a scenario of you see the the the, the hard rock jacks and they're being backed up by high defense infantry. That's what I'm seeing. So I'm still seeing uh, a lot of high armor. I guess I'm kind of seeing the same, but I think it's more cracking towards armor skew at this point because we're seeing so many jacks on the table. And at least with Signar, I mean, I have, off the top of my head, I can think of three casters that with their journeyman can put out, you know, two arcane shields or Dauntless Resolve, which is almost the same thing as, as arcane shield. So I'm seeing a lot of stuff that 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 can be very high armor. Um, for me, I really de I think it feel it depends on which faction you're playing. If you are playing, you know, like with me playing trolls, I see a lot of high defense skews that seem to be across the table for me, um, which usually doesn't end well for them because I usually bring a lot of ways to increase my mat. Um, and I can handle high armor. So I really feel like it depends on which faction you're playing will basically dictate which skew you're seeing. I and once again, I think it it varies on matchup. You know, if you if you're going one way or going the other, you know, if you play, you know, Kador, you're gonna have an easier time maybe with armor, you know, where if you might play another faction you have an easier time with uh defense. So is is you know, is really hard. So that's I where I end, stand. I think you may end up seeing a scenario where your, you know, a reoccurring appearance of two list pair where one list is extreme armor and another list is high defense shooting. And and people will design their two lists that way they're basically asking their question the, the question of can you deal with armor and can you deal with defense in the same list because otherwise you're in a 50-50 list chicken. So let me ask you, now that we're done all of our questions that we've been asked by the viewers, I have one question that I've, I've been curious about lately. Do you guys feel that we are locked into the fact that SKUs are going to become, once again, the, uh, you know, the major lists? Or do you guys feel like more, we're going to see more balanced lists? Because um, I know right at the end of Mark III, we had a lot of skew lists, you know, super high defense, super high armor, you know, a ton of lights. Some people got tired of that, and I had a conversation with a, at my store, and he says that one of the things that he has come to dislike about the game is just, like, everybody plays a skew now. Do you guys feel with Mark III that we're going to see more balance, or do you think it's just the you know, the curse of skews again? Um, I think that skews are being put, gravitated towards because they're easier. Like when you turn around and look at a caster and you go, oh, Karchev and six juggernauts. Okay, done. Like it's, it, it's easy to create that list. It doesn't, it doesn't take a lot of effort to design it and then thus have, uh, uh, deficiencies in the list because you just you immediately accept your deficiencies for all the benefits you gain from a SKU. Um, whereas when you start doing uh, uh, more all comer style lists, then it becomes a scenario of this this thought game of okay, well I've got this and I've got these deficiencies, so how to make up for it, and then trying to come out you know with the the all comer style, and it's just a matter of. Are you a person who likes to ask the question, can you handle the skew? Or are you a person who likes to answer the question, yes, I can handle your skew? I'm going to cop out and say I still think it's too early to tell. Well, there we go. Ending this on a cop out by Tony. So uh, that's everything, guys. That is a wrap for this episode. I just want to take a time to thank everybody who took the time to ask questions. Um, you know, it's we we're we're trying to start out this podcast and it's super invigorating for all three of us to every week come in and see that you guys are participating in the discussions and having the discussions it actually makes us feel like we're not just talking into a microphone for nobody's you know nobody caring really so thank you very much for taking the time to ask questions for to participating in the conversations on our video chats and uh I know it sounds super cheesy, but we do it for you guys. And if you guys aren't enjoying it, then we're just going to stop doing it. Yeah, no, I, I, I 
play great. I could not say that more. I mean, and I just, I want to thank you guys also for having the patience to go on this journey with us for a third time. Um, this is definitely the, the most amount of episodes we've put out for our third time going, and I feel like we are just continuing to keep improving, improving every single time. So any feedback you guys have for us, um, we're still working through some things like our audio quality and some of the editing. So any feedback you have for us, just please, please keep giving it to us. Let us know. Let us know on, on Facebook. Let us know on YouTube. Uh, so we can just keep improving. Another thing for anybody that's interested, I will be on Trollblood Scrum tomorrow night um, on their live stream. So I will be answering some specific questions about just trolls that uh, sometimes I feel like I can't answer on this podcast. Um, so if you guys would like to see that, uh, it will be Wednesday night over at Trollblood Scrum. Awesome. All right, uh, so that's a wrap for us. I want to thank you guys for listening to an episode of Turn Extension. Have a great night.